Strictly better cards is a term that I see used occasionally, but in a way which I think is a little misleading. I want to take some time to talk about one of the most recognizable, reprinted, and retrained cards in the game, and explain how the printing of objectively or arguably better cards affects design space. Before we get too deep into the discussion, I want to preemptively restrict the domain of discourse to just one-for-one -one spell or trap removal, for the most part. So cards like Breaker the Magical Warrior or Tornado Dragon will not be discussed, as those cards are actually plus one spell and trap removal, since the monster remains on board after activating their effects. Technically, Deep Sweeper could be in the domain of discourse, since it is one for one spell and trap removal, but getting on the field is more difficult since it requires either the normal summon or other cards to special summon it. I will also not be discussing mass spell and trap removal like Storm, Heavy Storm, Lightning Storm, A Wing Beat of Giant Dragon, Malevolent Catastrophe, or Harpy's Feather Duster, since those cards serve a different purpose. Some people would argue that mass removal cards are strictly better, but there are definitely times where precision is valued over the higher card advantage ceiling. Be wary of popping face down artifacts or even cards like Black Pendant or Hysteric Sign, which have an additional effect when they leave the field. Most of the time, mass removal is going to be the better option, but I wouldn't say that they are strictly better than some of the other cards featured in this video. With all that out of the way, onto the cards which I will be discussing. I think I want to start the discussion by talking about a few older cards which are strictly worse than MST Dispel and Remove Trap. Both of these cards are slower, at spell speed 1, and are each restricted to destroying either spell or trap cards, with trap remover being further restricted to only face up trap cards. I would say that this is almost objectively power creep, since MST has less restrictions, is faster, and has more utility. Also in this camp of cards is Gust and Driving Snow, which were released after MST. Both traps are similar in the way that they can destroy either spell or trap cards, but are at least a turn slower since they are trap cards themselves. And probably more than a turn slower, since they are reactive cards at that, responding to only your opponent's spell removal in the case of Gust, or trap removal in the case of Driving Snow. These cards serve as soft replacements for Mystical Space Typhoon, since MST was limited on the FNL list preceding the Pharaonic Guardian set, which introduced Gust and Driving Snow. There are actually a whole slew of watered-down MST cards, some of which even saw competitive play, but I am getting ahead of myself. I do want to first compare MST to another trap, Dust Tornado. Again, Dust Tornado is a turn slower being a trap, but that is not always a bad thing, since it can be used under Imperial Order or Secret Village of the Spellcasters, albeit at the cost of not being able to develop spell cards during your turn. There's also that niche upside of getting to set a card from hand, which I guess could be used with Ultimaya Zulkin, but I understand that is reaching pretty far. I do think that there is sufficient use case to justify saying that MST is not strictly better than Dust Tornado, which cannot be said for the following set of cards. The retrains Tornado, Twister, and Mystical Wind Typhoon each have a different take on balancing Mystical Space Typhoon. Tornado adds the condition of your opponent having three or more cards in their spell and trap zone. Twister has a 500 life point cost, and can only hit face-up spell or traps, Mystical Wind Typhoon has the restriction that it can only be activated as chain link 3 or higher, and only once that chain. It is tempting to write these cards off as dead on arrival, since MST is a strictly better card, but remember that MST was restricted at the time. There is a merit to functional equivalency or functional redundancy, where multiple cards serve the same function, although some do it better than others. Having more copies, even weaker copies, of a card can boost consistency and give for more options in deck building. This also helps to protect strategies from hits on the FNL list, key cards receiving errata, and even scarcity when the best version of a card may be difficult to acquire. This is definitely the case with this trio of cards, since fast spell and trap removal was still needed, with floodgates like Royal Decree and Royal Oppression especially. I do like how each retrain has a different strategy in rebalancing MST. When designing, there's a relationship between conditionality, strength of effect, and cost, which is more than just the text in front of the semicolon, which precedes the card's effect. I am adapting a triangle model my dad showed me, with the example he gave being painting a house. On the corners of the triangle are speed, quality, and cost. 
you can only choose to optimize two of these. So if you want the house to be painted quickly and well done, then it's not going to be cheap. If you want to get it painted quickly and for a low cost, then it's not going to be quality work. This can be expressed algebraically, but to quote Stephen Hawking, someone told me that each equation I include in the book would halve the sales. In addition, quantifying the power of different effects in the game is subjective, so I want to stick to the triangle model for now. We can swap the quality vertex for power of the effect, the speed vertex for conditionality, and we can keep the cost vertex, this time referring to not just the costs like discarding cards or paying life points, but also the opportunity cost of running a card in the deck. Dedicating a deck slot for spell and trap removal might mean cutting out a combo extender or a hand trap. You can optimize two out of the three sides once again. A card could be powerful and cheap, but is going to have some big restrictions in order to keep it balanced. And if you want to have a card that is unconditional and cheap, then it's not going to be powerful. Mystical Space Typhoon is spell speed 2, giving it one of the largest activation windows in the game, has no activation restrictions or other forms of conditionality, and the only cost to the card is running the card in the deck, since MST is one for one in terms of physical card advantage. It is tempting to call the card overpowered or a design mistake, but I think of it as the high watermark, effectively setting the standard for fast spell and trap removal, being the gold standard for other cards to be compared to. So what about those strictly worse cards, which are below the watermark? All three retrains are still spell speed too, but that does not mean that they have the same activation window. Tornado can only be activated when your opponent has three or more spells and traps, making it reactive, sort of similar to Gust or Driving Snow. Twister has the cost of 500 life points and can only hit face-up targets. Or, in other words, the card is more conditional and has a quantitative cost. Then with Mystical Wind Typhoon, the conditionality again comes from restricting when the card can be activated. A lot of decks can make two chain links on either the player or the opponent's turn, but it does make the card dead at least some of the time when MST would be online. This is another case where MST is the objectively better card, but it is still pretty insightful to consider the design philosophy behind these retrains. Next I want to talk about some of the stronger retrains or related cards. Nightbeam is not a quick play spell, so it has a much smaller activation window and is restricted to just face down speller traps. There is the small benefit which the targeted card cannot be activated in response to Nightbeam, but the opponent can still chain other cards around it to circumvent this restriction. I consider this to be a small side grade, so not strictly worse. Since Nightbeam is not weather related, it might not belong in this video, but is here for completeness. More obvious cards to compare to MST are Galaxy and Cosmic Cyclone. Galaxy Cyclone is again restricted to face down speller traps, but has the upside of potentially being a plus one in card advantage if it can be banished to pop another face up speller trap. That if is intentional, because the opportunity to pop another card may not even come up. In other words, the card is balanced by being slower, more restrictive, but with a potentially higher upside than MST. Then there is Cosmic Cyclone, which is closest to MST in effect. The big difference is that Cosmic Cyclone banishes instead of destroys. This comes at the cost of 1000 life points, but otherwise the card has the same restrictions as MST. Banishing is sometimes an upside, especially when we look back at cards like Hysteric Sign, which have graveyard effects, but at other times the card is just more expensive without functional upside. It is a good time to mention the concept of incomparables which are often demonstrated by a variant of the phrase comparing apples to oranges. Which one is more valuable, hitting both face down and face up speller traps, or having the potential for a plus one in card advantage? The answer varies from person to person, based on preferences, but also varies from deck to deck, based on how the deck is designed to function. Does your deck self mill or discard cards from hand? If so, Galaxy Cyclone looks more appealing. This applies to the metagame too, where if there are a lot of spell or traps which want to be in the graveyard, Cosmic Cyclone looks like a much better choice. This area of situational utility, or fuzzy upsides, is vital for long-term game balance. A strictly better card raises the high watermark further, and as a result, invalidates the cards beneath it. This is the most obvious form of power creep, when older cards become totally irrelevant due to newer cards 
with the newer cards either having fewer restrictions, lower costs, and or stronger effects. Side grades or cards with similar power level and functionality also increase the power ceiling for decks since they offer more deck building options, but do not exactly change that high watermark. This is at the crux of my difficulty with cards being labeled as strictly better versions of other cards, where it is not always tied to an objective metric. That being said, there are still more cards that I want to talk about when discussing the MST lineage. Starting with a couple weird ones. I thought about putting these in with Nightbeam, since they have similar functions and are also normal spells, but eventually I decided they deserved a mention in their own section. Bait Doll and Nobleman of Extermination are somewhat related, although both are only effective against face-down trap cards. Bait Doll is one of the weirdest cards in the game, forcing the activation of a trap card, which can have all sorts of weird interactions, but more often than not causes the trap card to fizzle, making Bait Doll sort of trap removal. It also has the strange effect to shuffle itself back into deck instead of going to the graveyard, which I consider to be a downside, since you cannot use it for cards like Spell Striker. Then there is Nobleman of Extermination, which will banish the trap and all other copies of it from both decks. This means that both players will get to see each other's decks, which does give some information. Banishing the trap just seems so forward thinking, and it just strikes me as a long lost relative to Cosmic Cyclone, although probably not as good as its successor. I also want to tag on Wild Tornado in this succession, since it is a retrain of Dust Tornado or a retrain once removed from MST. It has an effect similar to the original Tornado, this time hitting only face-up speller traps, then retains the back row setting ability of Dust Tornado, although it now applies to the destroyed card's controller. It is optional, but I guess you could nudge your opponent into setting another card for some unknown tactical advantage. Honestly, I don't understand the purpose for this effect. The second effect, though, I think is neat but also not particularly useful. It has a Dark Coffin-like condition that triggers when the set card is destroyed, then with the effect to destroy a face-up card on the field, an upgrade over the original Dark Coffin. I don't know if this card has a home in a deck or archetype, but it is interesting to look at at least. Moving on to the last category of MST Descendants moves away from the 1-for-1 one one spell and trap removal model. Double Cyclone is 2-for-1 spell or trap removal, not in the controller's favor. I think this card, in addition to Wild Tornado, could see some utility in artifact decks, although there are much better options for enabling artifacts. This may be an issue of Critical Mass though, where the deck requires a certain amount of self back row popping just to function properly. Then there is the card which is rumored to replace MST, Twin Twisters. As the same card economy as MST, being 2 for 2, which then reduces to 1 for 1, if, and only if, it can pop two opponent's Speller Traps. This card can essentially turn another card from your hand into an MST, and this can be good or bad depending on how much back row is needed for the format. I do not think this card has surpassed MST, but that might be because I see the fail case of going 2 for 1 to outweigh the success case of neutral card advantage to deal with more back row. The last card in this section is Chain Whirlwind, which can be 1 for 2 in the controller's favor. This card has the activation condition similar to Gust and Driving Snow again, but this time has the potential to pop two pieces of back row. This might be useful as another piece in that artifact deck, helping to get to that critical mass since it has a good amount of synergy with the strategy. There is one more retrain worth mentioning, but I'm saving that till the end. So why does this matter? This is a minor semantic problem surrounding a term, but I still think it's worth talking about. For one thing, I thought the sheer number of similar cards was worth mentioning, as it looks like there is a lot of functional redundancy and situational utility. I do agree that this set of cards are strictly worse than MST, but these cards all have niche use cases where they perform slightly better or worse than the original MST. Or in other words, I do not think that MST has actually been power crept by any of these cards, since there are notable pros and cons. In looking at other areas of the game, specifically with monsters, the number of characteristics like attribute, type, stats, and even the card name makes it much harder to isolate objectively better cards. Even when looking at just attack or defense, sometimes slightly lower stats are better, like for being searched with Witch of the Black Forest or Sangan. As far as how this matters for the competitive game, 
there is a complex answer. Twister in particular did see some experimentation and side decks when MST was at 1, but a lot of the other cards might have some utility in side formats like speed duels, duel links, or rush duels. Restrictions on the available card pool for the side games is done for balance, but also to preserve the design space that the introduction of MST would remove. This prevents a lot of cards from being dead on arrival. If you are constructing a cube or decks for alternate formats, some of these cards might be worth considering. But as the game continues to accelerate, the utility of spell and trap removal continues to decline. When is the last time you saw a staple trap being played? A lot of recent formats are just too fast for defensive back row. And although MST is pretty fast as a quick play spell, it is not fast enough to disrupt spells and traps when the opponent goes first. Getting rid of a linchpin field or continuous spell card can be vital in disrupting the opponent's combo. And I think there is one MST retrain which might have raised the high watermark. Typhoon is a trap, but with the special distinction of being able to be activated from hand when the opponent controls two or more spell or traps and the player controls none. It only hits face up back row once again, but the card being a turn faster gives it a vital edge, despite the other restrictions. Typhoon is a literal hand trap, a term which generally refers to monsters, which can be discarded from hand as a disruption tool. Ghost Ogre and Snow Rabbit is a great example, and at times can be used similarly to Typhoon as spell and trap removal, although with a much narrower use case. Hand traps in general are a consequence of the acceleration of the game, as games last on average fewer and fewer turns, traps and even spells become too slow to be used as disruption tools. At this point, even older hand traps like Herald of Green Light are in the realm of consideration, as it negates the spell, something MST is sadly incapable of. I would agree that MST is definitely responsible for removing some design space, specifically slower or conditional spell and trap removal. MST is an example of a strictly better card in these instances and can objectively be labeled as power creep, but I do not think that the same can be said for most, if not all, of the retrains or related cards in the weather-based spell and trap removal family. If anything has contributed to the erasure of design space, I would point the finger at the reduction in trap cards, which are a symptom of the acceleration of the game. But if there is a format in the future that is conducive to back row, then there are quite a few viable removal options to choose from, tailored to player preference and individual deck design. And maybe, just maybe, MST will see another heyday in the sun.